Oklahoma might not be as far off from the Alabama Crimson Tide on the recruiting trail. In fact, they might be catching them. We'll talk about that on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners, and thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. We're free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube, so go subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts, and on YouTube, hit that notification bell to let you know when new episodes drop. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. My buddy here is Josh Helmer. You can follow him on Twitter at Josh on Ref. You can also hear him Monday through Friday from 9 to noon on 94.7 The Ref in Norman. Josh, how you doing, man? Doing good. Catching Alabama. That's a... Uh... A fascinating concept. So here's where it comes from. All right. So on three, one of the big recruiting services just updated their 2023 recruiting rankings for the final time in the cycle. And he had two Oklahoma Sooners in the top 10. PJ Adabara at number four, Jackson Arnold at number six. The only other team with more than one player in the on 300 top 10, the Alabama Crimson Tide with three. Now, Alabama's got a far greater number of top 100 players than the Oklahoma Sooners do. But the fact that Oklahoma is just there right behind them in top 10 players, to me, it speaks volumes to what Brent Venables and his coaching staff is doing on the recruiting trail. And the fact that Oklahoma's number five in the 247 sports rankings, number seven in the on three rankings, although they haven't updated their team rankings. It says updated but they haven't updated the the player rankings in the team rankings yet. So I don't think those are fully updated just yet. I don't think Oklahoma's that far off. Now they got to get a few more five stars to be able to catch Alabama, but you got three in this cycle. Who knows what's going to happen in the 2024 cycle, but you, if you're able to start stacking multiple five-star, you know, signees in each and every class, if you're able to get to four, five, in a class, then it doesn't put you that far off from what Alabama is doing on the recruiting trail. So I, again, they're going to have to show it on the field for me to really believe that, okay, they're catching Alabama, but on the recruiting trail, this is a great start for the Sooners. And they, they need to continue to do it right. They need to stack classes and what they've needed to do, John is exactly what they've done in this class, which is, not have it just be a five-star quarterback and three five-star wide receivers. How long has have Oklahoma fans been waiting to see a collection of five-star defensive talent? And you've gotten that in this class when uh, when you think about both Bowen and P.J. Adabare. There's plenty more blue-chip defensive talent beyond that, but those two, that's that's unique to Oklahoma right now. They haven't really been getting that caliber of defensive players. So – that part is exciting, and it's a gap that Oklahoma had to close with, you know, Alabama is the name, I guess, that you say, but maybe now the name's Georgia, right? Back-to-back national championships for Georgia, and Georgia would fit that same profile too. Nine, nine Sooners in the updated on three, 300. That's, I mean, that's pretty salty, John. That's a, a good portion of your, your signing class. There's I I don't know what the number would be of teams that can stake that claim, but I'm guessing not very many, probably, probably like five, which is why you're in the top five. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's what puts them at such a high ranking uh, in these team recruiting rankings. So I extended this out to the top 15 because I was just really curious, really fast uh, because Peyton Bowen, number 15, Oklahoma's third five star in the on 300 rankings. And so we talked about Alabama having three of the top 10. Well, No other team has three in the top 15 aside from Oklahoma. So it's Alabama and Oklahoma with three each in the top 15. LSU has two in the top 15. um, And then you got the Georgia Bulldogs with two in the top 15 as well. So yeah. And uh, I think, okay, I just want to make sure I didn't miss Texas. Nope. I didn't miss Texas. Texas just has one player in the top 15. So I don't know. Pretty salty for the Sooners. Yes. Nine in the top 300 for the Oklahoma Sooners. And they, they pegged Samuel Omasigo, who our guy Parker Thune talked about last week as one of their 
largest risers. He went from number 100 to number 52 in the on 300 rankings. I think a lot of people were very, very impressed with his performance at the all American bowl down in San Antonio. Parker called him a, basically a college ready prospect physically. He's got the, the physical, well, we'll just say physique to be able to step into a power five program and be able to contribute immediately. You know, PJ Adabari being able to end up in the top five as the number four prospect, Jackson Arnold, number six and Omasigo seeing their rise over the last year. It, I think it creates a lot more like faith and a lot more goodwill for how we evaluate Brent Venables and his coaching staff in their evaluations, because Samuel Omasigo this time a year ago, he was a three-star prospect. Jackson Arnold and PJ Adabari, both four-star prospects this time a year ago. Each of those guys saw their you know, recruiting status, their, their recruiting profile, see an upward trajectory over the last year that landed them in the top, say, 52. I mean, uh, Samuel Masigo, number 52, like that's a fringe top 50 player. So if you're saying basically you have four of the top 52, that's pretty good. And you're, you're seeing what Brent Venables is able to do and, and that coaching staff. They're targeting some of these guys they feel like are on that upward trajectory. They're not staying stagnant. They're not staying, um, you know, they're not peaking as juniors in high school or sophomores in high school. They see that, okay, these guys got a lot more really good football left in them. They've got more progression and development that they can do. And, and to me, that's encouraging because you're what, what I'm seeing over at Sooners Wire, and I'm seeing a lot of these offers coming out for the 2024 cycle, it's a lot of three-star guys. And you might just kind of sit back and be like, oh, that's kind of you know, ho-hum, kind of a three-star guy. But you can we've seen in the 23 cycle three stars like Josh Bates, Heath Ozida, gain four-star status. Uh, you saw a guy like Caleb Hicks. You know, he's three-star in one place, a four-star in another place. Sam Omasigo, three-star, now he's a four-star. So what they are ranked now doesn't necessarily mean that's what they're going to end up as. They've got a whole, you know, off-season of camps and seven-on-seven seven, and then a full senior season to continue to, to kind of grow that profile before they finish out the recruiting cycle. But, yeah, just the, the, the number of guys that they have in the on 300 is pretty impressive and that doesn't even include Caden Green, which I saw a lot of, I don't, I won't say a lot, but I saw some kind of chatter with some of the on three guys. Like how, why is it you guys differ so much on Caden Green when he's basically a top 150 prospect with rivals and with 247? Why are you different? And ESPN for that matter. So why are you differing so much? I haven't seen a good answer yet. I'll be curious what that answer is because again, he looks like a consensus four-star prospect not making the top 300 would, is kind of curious to me, uh, but just kind of run down the list real quick of the guys that made the uh, on 300. I'm going to pull it up real fast for us. Uh, again, PJ Adabari at number four, Jackson Arnold at number six, Peyton Bowen at number 15, Sam Omasigo at number 52, Makari Vickers 118, Jacoby Johnson 190, Jacquez Petaway 222, Derek LeBlanc, 285. And one of the guys, friend of the show, we had him on last summer that I think a lot of people are kind of sleeping on a little bit. And that's Caleb Hicks at 297, just kind of just making it inside the top 300. Well, and again, I was going to mention Caden Green. I'm glad you brought him up. Probably most people, like you said, the, the other recruiting experts out there would say, why is he not in the, the on 300? So at, at, let's just go ahead and round up, right, based on the the other rankings that are out there and say that Oklahoma's got 10 uh, on 300 players, right? They don't, but just in, you know, just follow me with this. So that's six defensive players out of 10 that uh, are, are top 300 guys that Oklahoma's bringing in and, and four offensive guys. And to go back to kind of the theory that I think you and I both subscribe to and have co-signed on, it's – it's better to bring in the defensive talent early and than the offensive talent. You, you'd love to have both, right? Uh, you'd love to have 12 offensive on 300 guys and 12 uh, on 300 defensive guys. But, of course, that's not really realistic uh, outside of just some incredible historic class, right? But uh, if you had to lean one way or the other, I think you'd rather it be defense because, again, you can find those skill guys later. We've seen them in the transfer portal this go around. We see starting caliber quarterbacks every year now. Some very, very I, – I know Caleb Williams is kind of uh, the unicorn. I wouldn't wouldn't even really use his name, but just Oklahoma's quarterback, Dylan Gabriel, transfer portal quarterback. 
the uh, the the team that you're competing directly with for the Big 12 championship, probably mo- most likely next season. Quinn Ewers, transfer portal quarterback, we think, right? Unless things change quickly and all of a sudden it's Arch Manning. But the bottom line is you can get those offensive guys later. Oklahoma wasn't getting these defensive guys early in their signing classes. Now all of a sudden this staff is doing that. So, man, that's that's the most exciting part about it. And when the – Lead in is okay. Oklahoma's closing the gap with Georgia. Oklahoma's closing the gap with Alabama. Okay, yeah, let's wait and see and let's see the results get backed up on the football field itself. But that is something that they needed to close with Alabama and Georgia. They weren't doing that previously. They are doing that now. And just one final thought on some of the items that you mentioned there, John. The three stars becoming four stars, four stars becoming five stars as the cycle goes on, right? It would be so – it's probably something we should try and get in the habit of doing on this show right here is tracking sort of where Oklahoma's targets are at as we go through these – what is it, like three or four different updates to the update to the update of the recruiting rankings, right? That would really give us an interesting set of data to look at in terms of how well is Brent Venables and how well is the rest of this staff doing from an evaluation standpoint and then boom, you get two, three years down the line. And what does that production look like at the university of Oklahoma? And that would really give us a great idea, right? Of how, how head and shoulders above, or, you know, how many swinging and misses Oklahoma has from an evaluation standpoint, that would be fascinating because the early, the early results right here, John feels like, and this isn't just, you know, crimson and cream glass half full, It feels like Oklahoma has evaluated very well, and they've kind of been ahead of the curve in some of these recruitments, at least in this 2023 signing class. That's a great sign, right? Because what does that do, John? That gets your foot in the door before everybody else's foot is in the door, before Penn State's foot is in the door, before Alabama, before Georgia. If you're that program that identifies it sooner, I mean, you got a better chance to get the commitment and ultimately ink these top players. So that's that's a fascinating angle to follow. Yeah, you build that relationship early and you can continue to kind of stack relationship building, you know, with unofficial visits, official visits, junior day, you know, the champ you barbecue, all that stuff just allows you to continue to, to, uh, trying to think of the right word, but just continue to build that relationship. I use the word build. I was trying not to be redundant, but vocabulary lost me there for a second. Yeah. Foster. Thank you, Josh. Foster that relationship. Um, so it's going to be fascinating to see how, how this all turns out. We really like this 2023 signing class. It has the chance to be transformational for Oklahoma's defense in particular. You, you spoke on the defensive side of the football, and I think that's where the biggest impact will come from. Obviously, Jackson Arnold is going to be great, but scoring points and being good on offense hasn't been the issue for the Oklahoma Sooners. The thing that's going to have to get them over the top over the hump and back to becoming a national title contender is creating a defense that's able to hold teams under 20 points per game on a regular basis. Not a team that's like, we're going to hope to hold teams under 30 and then give our, you know, to give our quarterback a chance to win. No, you got to be getting into that 20 to 18 range to really start feeling like, okay, we're a legit defense that can win games for our offense if they're having an off day, because it happens. And going into the SEC, when you're going to be playing against Georgia, Bama, LSU, Florida at times, Auburn at times, you're going to be going up against some really, really good defenses, and your offense may have a down day. That's when you got to be able to rely on your defense to pick up the slack and hold their offense down just long enough for your offense to kind of get some things together. So I think that's why the defensive side of this recruiting class has a chance to be an incredibly impactful group as Oklahoma kind of transformate, transformates, transforms its defense over the next few years. This is just kind of 2022 is a bit of that foundation laid. 2023 is like the major part of that. And 2024 will continue to add on to that. All right. We are going to continue to talk about Oklahoma going into the off season. I asked over on the YouTube side in one of the posts, just what were the biggest questions that Oklahoma was facing? We're also going to talk about softball as we're just a few weeks away from the Oklahoma centers opening up their title defense. 
going for the three peat, going to try to pull off the Georgia before Georgia pulls off the three peat um, in the softball season. So we'll talk about that. But first, let me talk to you about our friends over at Bet Online. Bet Online is the fastest and the easiest place to bet on all your favorite sports from football to baseball, basketball, hockey, MMA, boxing, esports, you name it. Bet Online has you covered. It's easy to use. They've got great information there, great odds, great lines. You can get in on the action over at Bet Online. Again, it's the fastest and the easiest place to bet on all your favorite sports. You can get it on, on the MLB futures. There's already futures out there for college football. Who can win? Who's going to win the national championship? Oklahoma don't have great odds, but if you're looking for a long shot play and you just want to just have some vested interest in what the Oklahoma Sooners are doing, as if you don't already, maybe Bet Online is the place for you to do that. So Bet Online is where the game starts. So Josh, post the question over on the YouTube side. If you aren't, if you're not subscribed to the show over on YouTube, make sure you do that because trying to, you know, throw some interaction out there from time to time, post some comments, post some questions out there for you to interact with other Oklahoma Sooners fans. It's kind of like being on Twitter, but it's not. It's kind of more isolated, more concentrated to just your YouTube. Uh, subscriptions and feeds. So I just asked the question in your mind, what is the biggest question mark heading into the off season for the Oklahoma Sooners? Uh, Brent Chapman, he comments offensive line, defensive line, Josh, any thoughts? Yeah, uh, that's a fair place to start. I mean, I, to, to pick one probably, probably would lean defensive line myself. How much, how much can that group, improve in one off season's time how much this how much can this signing class that we're talking about with these six on 300 defensive players how, how much can they step right in and change Oklahoma both up front and then just across the board defensively I think that's the big picture question for Oklahoma just looking at the statistics I, I know we've got you know more comments to read but I just keep coming back to 123rd total defense for Oklahoma. I'm no rocket surgeon, as my friend Chris Plank would like to say, but uh, 123 nationally ain't going to win a lot of football games. It's just not. And it's certainly not going to win championships or get you in position to play for championship games. So what's the biggest question for Oklahoma? Yeah, it's a simple answer, but it's can this defense improve? Can they improve dramatically? And can they improve rapidly? Yeah. And that's where a lot of the, the comments go to is the defense. Um, you know, Robert, I'm going to really butcher his last name, but I'm guessing Walliger. Um, he just wrote defense, a defense, a defense, a defense, a defense, a defense. And I think you spoke to that in that for Oklahoma to take a step to get back to just the big 12 title game, being in contention for that, you can't have your defense giving up 35 points per game seven times on a season. That's just not a, a recipe for winning success and sustained success. So figuring out a defense that's going to at least get you back to under 30 points per game, closer to 25, I think that's a reasonable goal. Getting from average, allowing 30 points per game to allowing 25 points per game, I think that's reasonable. If they can do that, I think they're going to be in good position. If they can do better than that, they'll be in great position. But let's let's be reasonable. It's hard to you know build Rome in a day. So – I mean, you, you say 30 to 25 and it's like, ah, you know, how much of a difference is that? Uh, you, you know, I mean, it's basically a touchdowns difference, just generically speaking. Right. But uh, in terms of the scoring defense ranks, Oklahoma was 99th in that category. Right. Bottom third of college football, not the place that you want to be in any statistic. Right. Uh, generally speaking, not not the not the area you want to be. So Oklahoma was 99th scoring defense, as you said, the 30 points per game allowed. Where would 25 get them to? Well, all of a sudden you're 55th nationally. And that's not anything to throw necessarily a championship parade over. But honestly, John, and, and I was saying as much on the radio side earlier this morning, if Oklahoma gets to that point, that might be enough to get them to where they win the Big 12 championship again. If this offense stays where it is and just even – does it doesn't get any better, right? Doesn't ascend in 2023, which there's areas I think for this offense, John, to improve in 2023. Just simply put, better on third down, better on fourth down, just key situations, more accurate with the football. So I mean, there's areas for a good offense to honestly become a great offense. But let's say they don't even do that. 
let's just say that they stay right where they're at. John, I think if Oklahoma does what you're saying and gets to 25 points per game allowed, which would be 55th, just kind of smack dab in the middle nationally. To me, based on the landscape of what the Big 12 is going to look like, you're going to have a puncher's chance to win the league if that happens. And we saw a team like Iowa State play really, really good defense for much of their season and regularly hold teams to 20, 25 points a game. They just didn't have an offense to go with it. So if Iowa State can be that good defensively and cause that many problems, there's no reason that Oklahoma can't find some some significant improvement in just one offseason with all of the talent that they've added. We really, really love the defensive additions that they've that they've made through the transfer portal in the first portal period. That's there could be more coming down the pipeline. We don't know just yet. Uh, and to that point, somebody asked the question: Does Marcus Major transfer? Does he enter the transfer portal at some point? Right now, I'm kind of leaning no because he didn't do it. You know, during the the first transfer portal period, transfer portal period. Say that times five times fast. And so I'm kind of leaning no, but. Who knows? Well, and I, I'm not, uh, you know, boohoo and the, the common or anything. I think that's very far down the list for Oklahoma's pecking order of important offseason items. Wish Marcus Major well. Would love to see it work out at the University of Oklahoma. But you saw in the bowl game, Oklahoma is going to be just fine at running back with both Javante Barnes and Gavin Sawchuk. And oh, by the way, one of these, uh, one of these nine on three hundred guys that we opened the show talking about is a running back in Caleb Hicks, and they've got another guy in Mister Smothers that uh, is has a you know bright future ahead, I think, in Oklahoma. So again, not to just boohoo all over that point, but that is not toward the top of the list to me for uh, Oklahoma's concerns going into this offseason. Would love to see him stick around, but I think you're going to be okay even if that spring portal period rolls around. I guess what I'm saying is don't panic if Marcus Major is not around in a crimson and cream uniform in 23. Yeah. And the final comment or question is, comes from Gerald Preston. He says how quickly the offensive line comes together is one of his kind of bigger concerns. And I do think that, that that is a concern. You lose three starters in Anton Harrison, Wanya Morris, Chris Murray, Harrison is going to be a first round pick. I would not be surprised to see Wanya Morris as a top 100 pick. And then Chris Murray, he'll get drafted. He's just a good football player. He's not going to start right away for anybody, but he'll be a good rotational interior player. Probably somebody who will learn some center to provide some flexibility for whatever offensive line he gets drafted to. So I, I do think that is a question, but you bring in some veterans like Walter Rouse, Caleb Schaefer, got a guy like Tyler Guyton who's played some football now after, you know, doing some spells in injury, um, or relief situations of Anton Harrison and Juan A. Morris, I think you're in a pretty good spot with a, with where you're headed with your offensive line. You're always going to have turnover on the offensive line. You're always going to have turnover at several positions. And that is a key question. But we've seen Bill Biedenboe retool this offensive line year after year after year with varying levels of, of success, but it's generally been good, if not great, um, despite the turnover. No, that's right. And when I go on my little spiel, John, about, well, if the offense can just stay the same, well, you know, th there are some question marks there in terms of Oklahoma being able to do that because of, again, the turnover with the two tackles primarily, right? So we're going to see how all of that comes together. I do, I, I, again, would rank defensive improvement number one for me, but uh, probably, and that's just, very big picture. Hey, how much can this defense improve? Not even just, you know, Hey, defensive line linebackers, you know, secondary, not in, not individualizing between those position groups, just big picture defense. But uh, if, if not that, then probably yes. Next on the list would be, okay, well, how are these offensive tackles for Oklahoma going to hold up? And if the answer is not great, then okay. Then probably this offense is, I mean, the, the writing's on the wall, right? It's not going to be the same as it was this year. In fact, it will regress. So hopefully that's not the case. I think they've they've done a good job here by going and, and winning this recruiting war for Rouse and uh, Guyton. Seems like there's some serious potential there. So we'll see. And with the transfer portal kind of coming to a close and really kind of hitting the full-fledged offseason, we've got the early enrollees coming to, to campus. Let's turn the page because Oklahoma softball has first pitch just here in a few weeks with the Marionette Classic. And – 
10 Oklahoma Sooners were ranked inside of D1 softball's top 100, including four in the top 10. Josh, just an incredible list, including Tiara Jennings, who was the number one overall player. How incredible. I mean, this is, if we're going to equate it to anything, it's Alabama level talent acquisition to go from the number one player in the country and Jocelyn Allo to the number one player in the country and Tiara Jennings, which I mean, it's easy to think, okay, she's, she's Oklahoma's best player. She's going to be, but she would have been probably the number one player in the country. If Jocelyn Allo didn't exist in this multiverse. I know. And Oh, by the way, Oklahoma went and got a Lee and got a Sanders and got a Torres and got an Alex Staraco, which, oh, by the way, is still in a fantastic interview that you can search for right here on the uh, Locked On Sooners channel. Friendly plug for ourselves. But it's, uh, it's a roster that's just loaded with talent, man, and, and that reflects it right there. There's a reason that this uh, team is a two-time defending national champion, and guess what? There's a reason they're going to win it three years in a row. You know, barring some unforeseen, unfortunate circumstances, knock on wood in the health department, John, there's nobody that can beat this team. That's I'm not to be disrespectful to anybody out there, but there's nobody in college softball that's as good as this team. There, there just isn't. No, it's true. And I mean, you could have said that even before the transfer additions that they made, because you got Terry Jennings, who has hit over 400 for her career at Oklahoma. She's led the Sooners in RBIs each of her first two seasons. All the while, she's been kind of the protection. For Jocelyn Allo, right? We talk about, you know, power hitters needing somebody in the lineup to be able to force pitchers to throw to them. Well, Tiara Jennings has kind of been that for Jocelyn Allo. And then this year she got a little bit of protection with the emergence of Grace Lyons. So Tiara Jennings comes in at number one on the list. Grace Lyons, number four, who wildly or widely considered one of the best defensive players in all of college softball. Are, are you, she's the what two time defending defensive player of the year uh, in softball, at least in the big 12 side of things that shortstop she's at number four on the list. Uh, and then you've got, you mentioned Sydney Sanders coming over from Arizona state. She's number six on this list. Like she is a legit hitter as well. She'll probably slot in there somewhere three or four um, in the order, depending on where, what they decide to do. If they decide to bump Tiara Jennings up into the number two hole where Jocelyn Allo was, or if they want to leave Jocelyn or Jennings at her three spot so she can continue to be that, you know, run driver in her that she has become very efficient at. Um, I mean, they've got power up and down the line of Jordy ball after a phenomenal freshman season, she's number nine on this list. So you have four of the top 10 um, and then just continue to run down the list. And, and we can talk about any of these players um, after I do this real quick, Jada Coleman, number 15, such a great leadoff hitter um, just from a, a getting on base perspective, but also provides a little bit of pop. She had eight home runs last year. Kinsey Hansen, number 20 on the list, you know, had a bit of a down 2022 season, but she came through with a big, you know, three run home run or a big home run in the uh, college world series clinching win over Texas. But that's like a year removed from having 24 home runs in 2021. If she can re rediscover her power, then that, that's just another bat. Alex Duraco, who you talked about, she's number 23. Haley Lee, she's the transfer from Texas A&M. You got Texas A&M's best player. The only player that really threatened you during the NCAA tournament was Haley Lee, and you got her. And you got her to be able to go in, and now you have two guy, two catchers, Kinsey Hansen and Haley Lee, that you can kind of platoon a little bit. You don't have to play one of them all 60, 70 games. You get to kind of mix and match and you can put one of them in their, that DPI role or the DPH role, uh, sorry, DP role, the designated player role, put one of them at first base. You're, you're going to be able to do a little bit with those, with those two. Um, and then continue to work down the list. Alyssa Brito, who is, I felt like it was a really nice surprise last season, provided some power as well. Uh, came on strong down the stretch. Um, Alina Torres at number 89, on the list also coming over from Arizona state, really good third baseman also provides some power, just an incredible, just collection of talent on this team. And they've got a, some really good true freshmen that are coming in. We might not get to see much of them because of the, the depth that they have amongst their, you know, juniors and seniors. I mean, Jada Coleman and Tiara Jennings, they're just juniors. So they're kind of, 
I, I don't even say they're still figuring it out, but they haven't reached like their prime yet, like their prime of college softball. So it's crazy how much better this team could even be going forward, which is an amazing thing to think about. If you think about any other sport, and I know I'm talking for a long time here. If you took the best player, you took Michael Jordan off the nineties bulls and it was a totally different team. You take Jocelyn Allo off of the Oklahoma Sooners. And yes, it's a loss. You cannot minimize how great of a player she is but this team doesn't look like it's going to miss a step because of Patty Gasso, that coaching staff's ability to acquire and assemble talent. And we got to see it all play out on the field. This is just on paper, but it looks like it's going to be another phenomenal year for Oklahoma Sooner softball. Yeah. And I was, I was trying to do some impromptu digging here on, you know, how long it was, how many games in it was before Oklahoma was handed its, its first loss in 2022. And, I knew it was a, a long, long time dating to what the Georgia game, right? Where they got they actually had the lead and then uh, Georgia had that rally and came back and it was sort of a shocking loss and go figure Oklahoma came right back and thumped them the next game. But I, all of that to say this, Oklahoma's going to do that again this year where one of the storylines, I think a large way into the season, it would shock me if it's not that way. I know that Oklahoma's got this, uh, it, you know, very challenging schedule and they're playing great teams, but John, this this program, the players that we're talking about here, they are so talented. They are so much better collectively than everybody else that I'm going to be blown away. I'm going to be shocked if we're not having another conversation about, you know, several months into the season. Well, can this team, can they, can they go undefeated? Can they do that? And we've had that conversation each of the last two years, which is, I mean, it just speaks to the dominance and I will be, again, surprised if we don't do that with this year's team. And I'm not talking 15 games of the year. I'm talking 35, 40 games into the season to where it's a realistic thought, okay, can this team not only three-peat but but do it uh, in undefeated fashion? And I know there's going to be probably several people that are like, okay, stop it. Don't put that expectation. That That is where this program is at. It's amazing. Oklahoma went 37 games before they lost their first one in 2022. I think Josh, you're thinking of the 2021 season when they lost to Georgia down in Athens. Um, but this one, it was down in Austin. They lost four to two to Texas. Um, and then, you know, just rattled off another win streak up until the big 12 championship game where they lost to Oklahoma state. And then they only lost one time in the NCAA tournament. So in the NCAA tournament, it was to UCLA, who was the number four or five team in the, in the nation. In the Big 12 tournament, it was the number seven, eight team in Oklahoma State. And then Texas was a number eight team, 18 team in the country uh, during that run. So just a phenomenal thing. And you talked about like, okay, unrealistic expectations to expect somebody to go undefeated. Well, I mean, they they surpass all of our expectations all the time to go a whole season to play 62 games and only lose three of them. It's in, it's unreal. It's unfathomable. I mean, you could put the, you know, let, let's use another football reference. You could put the Georgia Bulldogs up. I mean, they've played what 30 games over the last two years. and They've lost one. Could they have a record? If they played 62 games, how many would they lose over the course of three, four seasons? Would they lose three? Would they lose more? It's hard to say, but I, that's kind of where Oklahoma softball is at. It's like a loss is kind of surprising anytime it happens because they're so good, both pitching, defense, hitting, that anytime that they get beat, it's just a shock. Now, it's 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 hard for any team to stay perfect, so you're not going to get overly critical if they drop a game. But it also wouldn't surprise me, man, if they could if they could roll through the season because of how good and how deep they are in the lineup, in their pitching rotation, because you, you talk about a, a two deep of, you know, Jordy ball and Alex Tarocco, and you got Nicole may coming off the bench. You got the one of the, the best pitchers in high school softball coming to Norman as well. I mean, you're just stacked at every single spot on this team. And so that's, that's pretty impressive. It's going to be fun. It is going to be, be another fun. fun spring for Oklahoma softball fans. Do not take this for granted because this is, Patty Gasso has made this normal and you know, the stars of this softball program have made this normal. And I mean, 
at this point, you know, I know that it's easy to just make the Alabama comparison. I think I said this last spring, though, John, going into the summer when they, you know, won it again. It's time to stop comparing them to Alabama. They're their own thing. Uh, I, I understand why the comparison is what it is, but they have they have created their own dominance in a different sport. It's unlike anything the sport of softball, for the most part, in the last however many years has seen. They are the standard bearer. Oklahoma is – that's that's the, the tippity top of the mountain is Oklahoma, and everybody's chasing them, and I don't see I don't see them getting caught this season so enjoy it enjoy it enjoy it because this thing is uh it's not guaranteed and there's only one program in america that gets to enjoy it and it's you sooner fans yeah for everything that's transpired over the last year and a half at least we've had softball so thank you patty gasso thank you oklahoma softball team we appreciate you and it's gonna be a lot of fun to watch this year again nothing is given everything is earned if you watch the special over on espn plus they talked about having a blue collar workman like attitude. And so they're going to go out there and give their best effort every single time that they take the field, but we're going to enjoy every minute, every pitch, every at bat this season. Make sure you're tuned in with us here on locked on Sooners, subscribe to the show, wherever you get your podcasts and over on YouTube, hit the notification bell to let you know when new episodes drop. But until next time, he's Josh Helmer. I'm John Williams. We'll catch you then boomer sooner.